Okay, it's certainly a great pleasure to be back here uh, at MIT and LNS. I was here for uh, exactly one decade, uh, four years as an undergraduate working with Bill, uh, four years as a graduate student working with Bill, and two years as a postdoc working with Bill. Uh, somebody said, gee, to me yesterday, I think it was Bob Jaffe, that was an awfully long sentence. Uh, but, I, but, but, I, but I didn't consider it that way. It, it was always been a, a pleasure, and I think uh, uh, the remark that uh, Fred made about Bill, I think, is probably characterizes uh, the experience uh, uh, better than I could, uh, which when he said that, talking about the spectrometer, uh, Bill wanted uh, this particular uh, design. People told him he couldn't have it. Bill got it anyway, and it worked out just fine. And I think uh, we, that was a, a good lesson that I learned uh, from how to do practice in the world of physics from Bill. Um, so I want to talk about some things that have been done, some things that are just are being done, and uh, some focus on where we're going uh, with electrons both uh, around the world, but mainly with the emphasis on Bates uh, and, and its CBAF. Uh, and I'll break it up into sort of two sections, one dealing with nuclei proper and the other uh, dealing with the nucleon itself, uh, both of which are receiving extensive attention. Um, the first part one might subtitle as uh, particle physics meets the many body problem. And there are certain issues uh, that, that I'll go into where uh, the nucleon itself, which is a sort of a particle physics object, uh, it, it meets uh, directly aspects of the many body problem. And in particular, this is the question of nucleon structure and nuclei. If those nucleons are modified, uh, it is certainly because of their, the presence of the many body environment. Uh, I'll say something about the ph phenomenon of color transparency and correlations. And then I want to talk about three aspects of low energy QCD that are receiving a lot of attention. Uh, these are the electric form factor of the neutron, the excitation of the uh, nucleon to the delta, and the strange quark content uh, of the nucleon. Uh, I'll just very briefly flash this since Bill laid out a lot of this groundwork. What makes the whole new generation of studies possible, of course, is the technical advancement to the new facility, the s new facilities. The single most important being the continuous beams, uh, but there's many others. High intensity, uh, access to internal targets with tens of milliamps of circulating current, polarization observables, and both large acceptance and uh, out of plane detection of reaction products. Um, so let's start with nucleons and nuclei. First question one might ask is, are they in there? And the answer is, uh, to some extent, sure, because one sees the inco incoherent scattering from nearly free uh, constituents, which tells us that the nucleus is composed of nucleons. Um, the next question one might ask, then, is are they the same as the nucleons you get when you buy a bottle of hydrogen? And the answer is no at some level. Um, and let's talk, I want to show four results that relate to these, uh, these two questions. The first, are they in there? We saw some of this Heppel data. Um, but one does indeed see uh, quite nicely the in, in the, in the uh, unseparated cross-section uh, throughout the periodic table from carbon to nickel to lead, uh, this structure that is the Doppler broadened quasi-free peak, early Fermi gas calculations by, and at the time, young E. Moniz. Uh, and everything appears here to be under control in the sense that at that time, this is data from the early 70s, you see the quasi-elastic structure, it has the right quantitative strength, the nucleus is composed of quasi-free nucleons. Uh, however, once these data were separated into their longitudinal and transverse components, uh, one sees uh, th there's many ways to represent this problem. One way is to represent it in terms of this so-called Y-scaling variable which, uh, in a first approximation, is the nucleon's uh, longitudinal momentum in the initial state. Uh, and when you divide out the appropriate nucleonic response, one would expect uh, a universal response that, that, that is, one, these, the data should scale uh, as a function of this single variable. And uh, the several momentum transfers plotted here, one sees that they indeed do scale in terms of that variable, but the deviation from our simp sim most simple idea, which would say that these two uh, response functions are scale equally, and one sees that uh, uh, they do not. The television people would like you to stand in the limelight. 
Oh. <laughs> ah, TV. So there's one problem uh, in our under understanding that may be uh, related to uh, the question of nucleons and nuclei. I will say a little more about it. Let me just quickly remind you of the, the first EMC effect, the ratio of the response function in a heavy system to deuterium. And in particular, one sees throughout this intermediate x region, where, where x is now is the longitudinal momentum carried by the struck quark, this degradation. Uh, and remembering that, these to, that what the structure functions are, are the quark momentum distributions, this, degrada that this degradation or the, at, uh, uh, at intermediate x says that there are fewer uh, uh, quarks uh, with those higher momentum values, uh, meaning longer range correlations. So in, in some sense, there are many mechanisms proposed, of course, to account for the EMC effect, but they all share the feature uh, that they do uh, have lo that the quarks have longer correlation lengths inside the nucleus. And in some sense, that certainly is a uh, many-body modification of the of structure of the nucleon in the nucleus. Another place where that might be relevant, return again to the Coulomb sum rule, which uh, as Dirk indicated, uh, measures essentially the charge of the nucleus and a two-proton correlation term, which one expects to uh, at least get small, if not go to zero, as the momentum transfer increases. And I remind you of two results. Uh, at, at both at Bates and Saclay, uh, very detailed studies were done on the few body systems. Uh, on, uh, and in tritium, one sees that it goes to the value z equals 1 quite nicely, and on helium 3 and 4, uh, it's either converged or nearly converged to the value z equals 2. When one goes to heavy systems, essentially all heavy systems, with the possible exception of uranium, indicate this quite sizable suppression uh, that, that Dirk alluded to of the longitudinal response. And it's much larger than can be realistically expected uh, from the effects of correlations. So one suggestion that was made, and it sort of gets back to, to the EMC, uh, is maybe the longer quark correlation length manifests itself as truly an increased radius. This is the, the swollen nucleons hypothesis. These things get bigger. You construct this sum rule by dividing out the free proton form factor. Uh, so if the nucleon was larger in the medium, the form factor would be dropping faster, and that you would make, therefore, an error uh, in, in dividing that out. That's a, a simple-minded picture. Um, One question then is, are these two effects, our EMC and this, this deviation from our simple ideas in the quasi-elastic region related? Uh, that's certainly not a question that, that I'm prepared to answer or I think has been answered. Let me just show you kind of a list of the things that people have thought about uh, in response to these questions. Um, that the nucleus exhibits an increased radius and magnetic moment uh, in the medium by various mechanisms. Uh, Renormalized vector meson masses is a, uh, and, and vacuum polarization involving uh, vector mesons in a, in a sort of vector meson dominance picture uh, has been popular. The idea of pion excess in nuclei, uh, that there, is, there are more pions per nucleon in a nucleus, because in addition to the, vert the loops that connect the nucleon to itself, one now has the possibility of meson exchange. Quark exchange between two nucleons as they pass by, it's certainly an allowed process for them to share, to uh, exchange quarks, which gives then on the average a larger length scale for those quarks to wander around. Um, and that's just sort of the, the uh, one example of the whole, uh, general class of topics, partial deconfinement, where the quarks are free to wander from nucleon to nucleon, or at least amongst neighboring nucleons, giving you the so-called six-quark bags uh, to the extreme limit, where they would be free to wander through the entire nucleus, uh, that is, it would percolate. Um, how, how might you uh, uh, attempt to look for this? Well, there's been two, uh, uh, there's been several, I will talk about two experimental attempts one is to measure the momentum transfer dependence of the proton knockout reaction, which we, if, uh, if we believe that we are interacting with a nearly free proton in, in, in inside the nucleus, then the momentum transfer dependence should be that of the free nucleon cross-section. And the other approach is to measure the longitudinal transverse character of that same cross-section, where you know you're only knocking out a single proton and, and going to a bound state of the residual system. So both these uh, uh, types of experiments have been done. 
at NICAF and here at Bates. Uh, it's easier to cover a wider range of momentum transfer just measuring the cross section. Uh, and one sees for carbon knockout that within the error bars, both for P shell knockout from the P shell of carbon and the S shell of carbon, uh, over a pretty wide range of momentum transfer, almost up to a GeV squared, where uh, the nucleon form factor has changed by more than an order of magnitude over this range, to within the, about the 15% level, these data are flat. We have divided out, plotted as a spectroscopic factor, but what that means is we've divided out the free nucleon response. So what these data are telling you are, at the level of their errors, the response versus momentum transfer of a proton in carbon looks like the free one. One can then put limits on how much the radius could change on the basis of these data, and it's about 15 percent. Uh, and certainly one hopes, uh, one expects that uh, at, with the 100 percent duty factor and more intensity, these, these error bars will, will, over the next several years, be brought down considerably. The other way to look at this is to look at this so-called, this ratio RG, which for a free nucleon turns out to just be the ratio of GMP over GEP, which is the magnetic moment of the proton, 2.79. And that's indicated by the uh, horizontal line here. This has been measured at NECAF and, and one point uh, at Bates. And one sees that uh, over a more modest momentum transfer range, a slight deviation for these several nuclei and shells from the uh, free space value, but I indicate that this, once one does real DWIA calculations of this and puts in the proton distortion and some differential effects that are uh, totally conventional, these data are, uh, are, those effects are consistent with these data. So there is, uh, I think, I end that section just echoing Dirk's remark, this, this question of uh, at intermediate energies of the longitudinal transverse uh, response, the suppression of the Coulomb sum rule, remains an important open question on the one hand, and we certainly haven't seen in the same energy region any, uh, dis any smoking gun signature for nucleon modification in the medium, and, uh, to the, although we've looked. Nucleons, when we knock them out of the nucleus, well, the kind of things I was just talking about were related to initial state properties. The final state may also be quite interesting. Uh, in particular, uh, there's been a prediction now that's been around for quite a while, because the phenomenon of color transparency. Uh, it's a prediction of perturbative QCD that, in, there's, that the, there's a lack of absorption in hadron nucleus interactions at high Q squared. You basically need three things to happen for this to be true. You need to produce small objects at high Q squared, basically the spatial extent of the object being roughly 1 over Q. Then those small objects have to have small cross sections, basically because they will have a small color dipole moment. And then those objects have to get out of the nucleus before they expand, because if you, say, knock out a proton that where initially the three quarks were quite close together, it's going to blow up until it, and when it, by the time it's reached its asymptotic state, your detector. Um, so if those conditions are met, uh, one might expect to see a dramatic effect in nuclei. Um, let me just show you what the, how, what the effect might be. Here's the picture of what the Q-squared dependence is based on this cartoon. At high Q-squared, it, it moves further out before it expands. The red circle is, of course, the nucleus. So you would expect increased transparency uh, as you go to higher Q-squared. While at fixed Q-squared, you would expect more transparency for a small nucleus than a big one. And those, that general feature of is, of course, borne out by all the uh, more detailed calculations, of which I show one here. Uh, you see uh, the decreasing transparency as A gets bigger and the increasing transparency uh, as, uh, uh, as the momentum gets higher. Now, this is, would be uh, uh, unambiguous detection of this would certainly be of great interest. There are several experimental initiatives. Um, there is data, uh, somewhat controversial to explain at the moment, uh, on P2P uh, at Brookhaven, which I won't talk about at all beyond that. There is EE prime P data from SLAC experiment NE18 that is currently under analysis. Uh, that the data's all been taken, and uh, uh, we should know an answer on that before too awful long. And there are proposals uh, for more uh, of this uh, at SLAC going to higher momentum transfer. NE18 went to about 7 GeV squared. They want to double that. And both uh, EE prime P and also EE prime P with polarization uh, at somewhat lower momentum transfers uh, at CBAF. Let me just quickly 
show you some, just the, some preliminary results, although not the Q squared dependence of the SLAC experiment. But to someone who's done coincidence experiments at 1% at duty, the fact that they get these data at uh, 10 to the minus 4 uh, duty, I think, is, is really quite impressive. You see missing energy spectra on carbon at a Jev squared, uh, the P and S shell structures uh, uh, cleanly seen, no background beneath the nucleon threshold. And probably the most impressive picture is gold at 7 Jev squared, uh, where even uh, and under those extreme conditions, low cross-section, exceeding low duty factor, they obviously uh, still get a very nice clean signal out of there. And we certainly look forward to the results of, of that experiment. At CBAF, let me show you one projected result. There's the, there's the standard one wants to look in carbon and oxygen and so forth. And the standard picture showing uh, the no, uh, no a Glauber uh, treatment of the final state interactions, which are essentially energy independent, and then the kind of size of effect you'd expect from color transparency. The interesting thing about this one proposal is that uh, in addition to exploiting high resolution, so that even uh, in, in the Hall A uh, setup, so that you can even separate uh, the P3 halves and P1 half shell in oxygen, uh, it'll also attempt to measure the, the component of proton polarization in the final state normal to the reaction plane. In plane wave impulse approximation, that is, if the proton had no further interactions with the nucleus, this component is identically zero. It's like the fifth response function that Bill Turchinets alluded to. Um, an observable that is rigorously zero in the absence of final state interactions is therefore uh, a quite sensitive probe of those final state interactions. And it will be quite interesting to measure both the cross section and, this, uh, and the momentum transfer dependence of this uh, induced polarization simultaneously. There was a crucial assumption that goes into essentially all uh, the previous slides, in particular the, the picture uh, also of the color transparency uh, prediction, that the, the, that the scattering results from a one, an interaction with a one-body current. That is, that all the energy and momentum of the photon is absorbed on a single nucleon. Uh, there's a series, been a series of experiments at Bates, at Saclay, and Niekep that reveal the limitations of this concept. One sees, for example, uh, interaction with two nucleon pairs, that is a deuteron-like object in the ground states of helium-3 and 4. One sees uh, an additional component to the transverse uh, response function that's associated with the two nucleon threshold, even when you sit right on top of the quasi-elastic peak, that is, at x equals 1. And to my mind, anyway, these are the most dramatic data that indicate uh, this effect that was the thesis work of Paul Ulmer. Um, this is the missing energy spectrum on carbon. The longitudinal response, the 1P and the 1S structure, and then zero out here. And just a quick glance shows you how qualitatively different the transverse response function is. Excess strength out to the deepest missing energies that were measured. Obviously still the S structure present, but there's clearly something present that's at the moment not understood quantitatively, something present in the transverse response that's definitely not there in the longitudinal. If you look at the difference between the two, it rises up from two nucleon threshold. Uh, that, that's where that excess strength starts increasing. And that's subsequently been confirmed by NECAF measurements on a couple of nuclei. This strength out in the continuum seems to grow and grow as other experiments of Bates have revealed, in particular the thesis work of Larry Weinstein and uh, John Morrison. As one looks at the strength in the missing energy continuum versus Q squared, uh, it starts to rise up. It may become flat. Uh, of course, it's hard to say on the basis of three points. But it comes up from numbers around 30% to numbers uh, of order 40%. Now, that's 40% of the cross-section in the deep missing energy continuum in processes that are presently not understood. Uh, and, and so one has to be quite careful about uh, uh, interpreting uh, missing energy spectra in terms of uh, just one, one or uh, body responses. The, and the questions that, are, that the initiatives will address here, uh, Bill also had those up. Uh, I phrase them just a little bit differently. How does the hadronic many-body system absorb the energy and momentum of a virtual photon? What is the role of multinucleon currents? 
uh, and what are the role of subnucleonic degrees of freedom with the ultimate uh, goal of finding the limits to a conventional meson baryon description. Now I want to switch from nuclei to a nucleus, the nucleus of hydrogen, and talk about things that go beyond the constituent quark model. If the nucleus was, if the nucleus, if the proton were, were really just U and D quarks in a spherically symmetric SU6 wave function, there are three things that would be rigorously zero. One is the electric form factor of the neutron. The second are the quadrupole components of the n to delta transition. And the third, essentially by definition, is the strange quark content of the nucleon. So those are three things, if they're non-zero, require us to go beyond this. Let's talk about the neutron electric form factor first. Its derivative at low Q squared is the neutron charge radius squared. That charge radius is measured quite accurately, scattering the thermal neutrons from atomic electrons uh, to have this number. Uh, it's not, it's uh, negative, meaning there's more charge, more negative charge at big R in the neutron. It's positive in the center. And for comparison, I show this, the proton radius here. It's, you take the square root. The neutron radius is not small. Uh, it's 16 percent of that of the proton. And the neutron form factor, it's not being non-zero, telling you how the deviations from symmetry in those quark wave functions, it's a sensitive probe of quark configurations. It's also difficult to measure because it is small. In the cross-section, it occurs quadratically and summed with the large magnetic form factor squared. So what one would want is observable as that are linear in GEN, and that means going to uh, polarization studies. There are several prospects and techniques for attacking GEN, a couple of which have already been developed and used uh, at Bates in initial uh, what I call proof of principle studies. These are the scattering of polarized electrons from polarized helium-3 in two different groups with two different targets, and the neutron spin transfer uh, that Dirk mentioned. Uh, working at relatively low Q squared in these initial experiments that developed the technology and showed, yes, indeed, these things can be done this way. Under development are polarized solid state targets, ND3 at Virginia, and Deuteron atomic beam source for BLAST uh, at, at Wisconsin. The next generation of experiments will try to cover Q squareds uh, up to about 0.6 GeV squared at Bates and maybe 2 GeV squared at CBAF uh, with uncertainties of order 10 to, 10 to 15 percent. Let me show you what the current situation is. Old data. Now, here are the two measurements from Bates on the polarized helium-3 and the neutron recoil polarization, uh, which is preliminary. Uh, only point I want to make here is that both these measurements were very statistics limited. The techniques work. They've been demonstrated, and one hopes to achieve the kind of error bars one really wants to see, 10 to 15 percent, in basically uh, a little more current, a little more beam time. Uh, but there's no question that, that these methods are feasible. And what's on the table for the next round of experiments would give error bars uh, like that, based on a couple of different models. But here, is, here are two more Bates points using the South Hall ring, CBAF points using the recoil polarization, and CBAF points using the uh, polarized uh, deuterium target. Uh, and this, once this program is complete, in maybe the end of the late, late this century, uh, we'll have made a tremendous difference in our knowledge of the neutron form factor. There are also will be attacked with polarized internal targets uh, and the blast detector that Bill showed, both polarized helium-3 and polarized deuterium. And I show the projected error bars uh, and the results of several either parameterizations of the neutron form factor or the case when it's zero. And in all cases, one sees large sensitivity in, these, in the measured asymmetries to, to GEN. And, uh, and it's certainly important because one has to go to a nucleus to get the neutron target to do this uh, recoil neutron detection, polarized helium-3, polarized deuterium uh, will all give us confidence that what we're seeing is GEN and, and not uh, maybe nuclear physics. Um, let's turn to the end of delta transition. In the quark model, SU6 quark model, this is the spin flip of a single S1 half quark. So you have uh, giving you a, a spin 3 half state, just a single quark spin flip, which would mean the transition's pure magnetic dipole. 
But for example, uh, color, the color hyperfine interaction that results from a one gluon exchange potential, uh, among other things, uh, can give D state components uh, in, the, in the nucleon and delta wave function, very much an analogy to the way the tensor force gives D state components in the deuteron wave function. And that would allow non zero Coulomb and electric quadrupole amplitudes. Having D state in there, the, the, that there might be uh, a significant D state in there, was suggested a long time ago by Glashow to. Uh, resolve some problems in the simple quark model had with, say, calculating the axial vector coupling constant, the F to D ratio, and more recently, uh, it's been suggested that uh, uh, these D state components are relevant for, for the role of uh, quark angular momentum contributions to the spin structure functions. There are the same, exact same remarks about quadrupole components as apply as I made for the neutron. They're sensitive, they're difficult, and you need some observables linear in them to, to get at them. There are, Dirk showed one picture uh, of the E2. The, C, the E2 is actually known a little less, uh, a little worse than the C2. Here you see that the existing data don't even really agree on the sign, whereas the, uh, the Coulomb quadrupole, although with large error bars, uh, at least uh, seems to favor a value around maybe minus 5, minus 7 percent of the, these are plotted as ratio to the dipole. Um, there are several initiatives to look at n to delta, both at Bates, using polarized electrons and recoil uh, proton polarization, and polarized electrons and out of plane detection uh, of the protons. And these will be quite complementary studies, and at CBAF, of course, to extend to uh, higher momentum transfers. The same technique with polarized protons, and also polarized proton targets in class, and unpolarized measurements covering, covering a very wide range of, uh, of momentum transfers. And when all the CBAF experiments are done, one might hope to go from this to cases like that, where the larger points result from the recoil polarization, and those are the same class points that, that Dirk showed. How am I doing time? You're all done. Oh. Well, let me, I got a couple, two, I mean, two more slides. Uh, let me just, I got to say something about parity. Uh, it's the, la the last, uh, uh, I won't maybe motivate it so much, the strange quark content of the nucleon. We expect that there is some, are some strange quarks in there on the basis of, say, pion nucleon sigma, the polarized EMC, and simple cartoons like so, which, uh, where you can have SS bar components mixed in in a quark gluon picture, or even in a more conventional picture, you can have proton fluctuations into lambda k. Say, all of these things can give you uh, a strange quark component in the nucleon. Um, you access it by one way to access it is by parity violating electron scattering on the proton. Um, just to, you use the Z0 as a probe of the hadronic structure. And the important point is that the, there's an, a, a, a contribution to the electric part that's seen by the Z that comes from strange quarks. And similarly, for the magnetic, by combining the photon and the Z0, you make the, the strange quark contribution explicit. It shows up explicitly in the asymmetry. So you measure that asymmetry. There's many initiatives to measure that asymmetry. Let me just say what the initiatives are and then go to my last slide. The initiatives, based on two facts. One is that the strange quark content has unknown low Q squared properties. That means radius and contribution to the magnetic moment. And it also has an unknown Q squared dependence. The sample experiment at Bates is looking at very backward angles at low Q squared the goal being to go after the strangeness contribution to the magnetic moment, mu strange. Hall A at CBAF, it will use forward angle scattering, try to make very precise measurements using the existing uh, high resolution spectrometers over this momentum transfer range. There's a proposed new detector for Hall C at CBAF that would make, uh, could go lower at forward, uh, go to low Q squared at forward angles, and also uh, then be used, useful for at backward angles to try to separate the electric and magnetic strangeness contributions. And finally, there is a proposal being prepared for end station A at SLAC uh, that would use high energy electrons and forward angle uh, to, uh, to look at this. So my last slide is just to, I can actually put every, 
parity violating electron scattering proposal or experiment that's currently under, underway. They actually all fit on one slide. Um, in the green curve is a standard model calculation with no strange quarks. Um, and the black curve in each case is uh, uh, the, the fit of Bob Jaffe, probably extended to Q squareds where it has no business being extended to. Um, we see sample over here. We see CF are the Hall C forward angle measurements here, the Hall A measurements here, CBAF backward angle measurements here, and finally at the highest case, at the highest momentum transfers, the slack measurements, and in each case the deviation from the appropriate uh, uh, curve. Um, the final remark I want to make about this picture in addition, this is a decade of very nice physics. If it gets done, we learn a tremendous amount, new window on the nucleon uh, with the weak neutral current and all these experiments aim for reasonable precision. And I note that the, at least one of the co-spokesmen on every one of these experiments is either got his thesis uh, at MIT LNS or was a postdoc in L at LNS and I think that carries on the spirit uh, of the laboratory in a fine way to take it to this new probe of the nucleon and to have every experiment coming from someone who had an association with the, the laboratory at one time. All right, thank you. <laughs>